Elsewhere, we have discussed what it means for a number of vectors to be linearly dependent or independent. In this presentation, I'm going to take my vectors to be three-dimensional. That means they'll have three components. I'm also going to work with just three vectors. We'll call them u, v and w. Let's write down what it means in three dimensions for u, v and w to be linearly dependent. Here is the definition. u, v and w are linearly dependent if we can find constants c1, c2 and c3. They should not all be zero, but which when you use them to combine the u, v and w, you end up with the zero vector. c1, u plus c2, v plus c3, w equals zero without the c's all being zero. The question I'm going to address here is how do we decide whether such c's exist and if they do exist how can we find them? I'm going to choose some specific vectors u, v and w to demonstrate this. Here are the vectors I've chosen. Now it might be that you could look at those vectors and decide immediately whether there's some combination that makes zero. Actually it's not all that hard but I want to demonstrate how we would do it in general. To do that, I'm going to treat my vectors as column vectors and write out the equation involving the c's with the vectors substituted with their values and written as columns. We'll have to do that on the next page. It looks something like this and we've got to fill in the numbers. Let's go back and check them. First, the first column. The first column was c1 then times u and u is the vector 1, 2, 4. But I need to write that in column form now. There it is. Now we need to do the same for v and w. I'll do them all at once. You can go back and check if you have to. This is what it looks like. If we break this up into the first, second and third components, it will give us three equations for the three unknowns c1, c2 and c3. Let's write those all out now. There it all is. That's what they look like. Three simultaneous linear equations for the coefficient c. I hope it should be familiar to you if I say that this could be written as a matrix equation. It looks like this. Just A times C equals zero, where A will be a 3 by 3 matrix. It will be a 3 by 3 matrix containing all the coefficients from our three vectors U, V and W. The vector C is just the column containing the three unknowns in the right order, C1, C2, C3. Written in this form, we can immediately come to a powerful conclusion about the C's. Let's write the matrix equation out again on the next page. Here it is again. Now let's think for a moment about how we might solve such a matrix equation. You should know that as long as A is non-singular, that is as long as A has an inverse, we could multiply both sides by A inverse. It would look like this. The left hand side just gives A inverse A which simplifies to the identity matrix. The identity times C will still be C. On the other hand the right hand side simplifies to zero still. So we would end up with C equals zero. If the vector C is zero then all the three components must be zero as well. And we know that if all the three components are zero then the original vectors U, V and W must be linearly independent. But of course all this relied on A inverse existing, so we need to delve a bit deeper into that condition. Let's just reiterate what we've discovered. We take the three vectors in the form of columns, put the columns together into a matrix and call it A. If A inverse exists, then the U, V and W are independent because the only possible values for the C's are all zeros. So it all comes down to whether A inverse exists. We can decide, wh decide whether A inverse exists by asking about the determinant of A. To have an inverse, the matrix A must have a non-zero determinant, because in the inverse we have to divide by the determinant. If the determinant is zero, we can't divide by it, and so the inverse does not exist. Let's summarize that on the next page. For A inverse to exist, the determinant should be non-zero. If the determinant is zero, there is no A inverse. 
If there is no A inverse, then we can't solve the equations in the way that we did with A inverse. That means that in principle there might be C's that are non-zero that satisfy the equations. In that case, U, V and W would be linearly dependent. So we can now make that correspondence between the determinant of A and the dependence or independence of the C's. So we form A from the columns of U, V and W. We take the determinant of A. If it is non-zero, that means A inverse exists. That in turn means that the C's must all be zero, and so the U, V and W are independent. I would then also claim that if the determinant of A is zero, that means there is no A inverse. So non-zero C's do exist, and that means U, V and W are dependent. Actually, I've rather jumped the gun a bit there. Can I really assume that such C's exist? We need to look at that in a bit more detail. Before doing that, though, let's just check the determinant of this A. I think we're going to find that these vectors are linearly dependent. Here's the A again. Let's work out its determinant. It breaks down like this, and then we can simplify the 2 by 2 determinants. I'll leave you to work that out for yourself. I'll give you the answer. It does indeed come to 0. That means that we're expecting these vectors to be linearly dependent. In turn, that means that we should be able to find values for the C's that combine the vectors u, v and w to make 0. To do that, we would have to solve the simultaneous equations for the C's. We'll do that by Gaussian elimination. Here's the initial matrix. I'm going to start by letting row 2 become itself minus 2 of row 1, and row 3 become itself minus 4 of row 1. That will put zeros in the first column. That's the first step. Now, leaving the first row alone, I'm going to divide the second row by negative 7 to make it a row with 1s in, and the third row by negative 10. That will also make it a row with 1s in. Next, we can get rid of row 3 entirely by subtracting row 2 from it. We've now got a row completely of zeros in the third row. In fact, this is a direct result of the determinant of A being 0. If debt A is 0, we can always use Gaussian elimination to get at least one row of zeros, possibly more, but at least one. This system of equations is now solvable for the C's. I'm going to do one more Gaussian step, though, to make it a little easier to solve. I'm going to get rid of the 3 in the first row. I can do that by subtracting 3 of row 2 from row 1. So here's my final reduced form that I've circled in red. From this, it's easy to read relations between the C's. The top row tells us C1 plus C3 equals 0. And the middle row tells us C2 plus C3 equals 0. Here are those equations. Clearly, we could now solve them for C1 and C2 in terms of C3. Written this way, we can see that C3 is a free parameter. We can choose it to be whatever we like. 1, negative 1, 13 pi over 49 if we want, but that would be foolish of course. I'm going to choose C3 equals negative 1. That will make C1 and C2 both equal to 1. It now just remains to make sure that these values actually work, that we can combine the vectors u, v and w in that way and get 0. We'll do that on the next page. It should look like this. Let's write out the individual components. The arithmetic's not hard, and I think you can see that those numbers all come to zero. Sure enough, we've found the right combination of C's. Why did that work? Well, remember, it was because the determinant of the matrix formed from the columns was zero. That enabled us to write a row of zeros, at least one a row of zeros, when we did the Gaussian elimination. That, in turn, allowed us to solve for some of the C's in terms of others. Having the determinant zero guaranteed that there was some combination of C's that was non-trivial for which the combination of vectors would come to zero. Hence the vectors were linearly dependent. 
I think a summary is in order. We used three vectors in three dimensions, but actually all of this would have worked for n vectors in n dimensions. We write the vectors as columns and construct a matrix that we call A from them. In n dimensions with n vectors, that matrix will be an n by n matrix. Once we've got A, we check its determinant. If the determinant is not zero, then the only possible combination of the vectors that makes the zero vector is with zero coefficients. In that case, our vectors are linearly independent. On the other hand, if the determinant is zero, then in principle we can use Gaussian elimination to create at least one, and possibly more, rows that are completely zero. In that case, it, that means that we will be able to solve for some of the C's in terms of others. In that case, the vectors are linearly dependent. We've found some fairly powerful tools here. However, it's worth mentioning that actually this only works when we have the same number of vectors as the number of dimensions. In order to take a determinant of A, A must be a square matrix. It must be n by n. If we have only two vectors in three dimensions, or six vectors in nine dimensions, we can't take the determinant. That doesn't matter too much, because we can still do the Gaussian elimination, and it will still be possible to determine whether the vectors can be combined in terms of each other, just by doing the Gaussian elimination. All it means is that we don't have the determinant check to do first. That concludes my presentation.